Well, good morning, and uh, welcome to Northwinds Church Online this Palm Sunday. So excited that you've decided to join with us as we worship the Lord together in, in song, and now as we look into God's Word. And I want to remind you of where we've been for the last couple of weeks. Uh, we have, three weeks ago, looked at and focused on uh, what is certain, because we live in very uncertain times. And I think even just this past week, many of you, if not all of you, have experienced some uncertainty. It could be uncertainty in your household, uncertainty in your circle of friends, uncertainty in your workplace. But you've just experienced a lot of uncertainty. And I want to remind you of that message. Focus on what is certain during these uncertain times. What is certain is that God is on his throne. What is certain is that he cares for you. Uh, that he doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the alpha. He's the omega. He's the beginning. He's the end. And then two weeks ago, we looked at God's reputation as being omniscient, the all-knowing, sovereign God, the one who is in control. And since he is all-knowing, none of this took him by surprise. Uh, it has been a reminder to me again and again and again uh, that that the these events I didn't see coming and those who I am in a circle of friends with none of us were talking about this in advance uh, we might have heard about it a little bit but we didn't we didn't think of the ways that it would affect our everyday life but our omniscient all-knowing God the one who is in control none of this took him off guard in fact you could even say that the story of this has been written thousands of years ago thousands of years ago and so God knows how he's going to get us through this he knows exactly why he has us going through it uh, he knows the lessons he wants us to learn he knows the things that he wants to do in our hearts my question would be are we acknowledging him as the omniscient God the all-knowing God the one who's in control last week we said you know what Today has enough trouble of its own. Let's live one day at a time. All right, Lord, here we go. Get me through today. A walk with me. Encourage me. Show me the way. Guide me with your word. Comfort me through the difficulties one day at a time. Well, today what we're going to do is uh, we're going to look at the story of Palm Sunday. And what I want us to do is I, I want us to avoid what I would call the great mistake of Palm Sunday. And so I've titled today's message, Don't Pick Up Your Coat. At this point, all husbands are looking at their wives saying, I like this guy. Not too bad. I'm not going to pick up my coat. I don't normally pick up my coat, but my wife tells me that I should pick up my coat. We're not talking about that, okay? So you're still going to have to use the dirty clothes hamper for your clothes. You're still going to have to use the coat rack for your coat. I'm not talking about that. It'll become a very apparent what we're talking about in just a little bit. But let's dive right into it. Uh, this account, the account of, of Palm Sunday, of the triumphal entry, it's found in all four Gospels. We're going to be reading in Luke chapter number 19. Luke chapter number 19. I want to give you some time at, at home there to go ahead and open up your Bibles. Every time we come together, we're going to open up our Bibles. We're going to study God's Word, and we're going to seek to learn from Him. I'm not here to give you some sort of an inspirational speech. I'm here to allow God's word to speak. And so again, open up your Bibles. We're in Luke chapter number 19. We're going to start in verse number 29. It says, as he, talking about Jesus, approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie the colt and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Tell him the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? It's not surprising that Jesus knew in advance, hey, when they ask you why you're untying the coat, here's what you tell them, the Lord has need of it. Well, continuing on in verse number 34, it says, they replied, 
talking about the disciples to the owners, the Lord needs it. And the disciples brought it to Jesus. They threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. Verse 36 says, As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. And when he came near the place where the road goes down, the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles that they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Verse number 40 says this, I tell you, Jesus replied, if they keep quiet, talking about the disciples and, and the crowd that's following him, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. The stones will cry out. And a, a parallel passage to this that I want to read immediately following is found in John chapter number 12. John chapter number 12 says this, and we're going to start reading in verse number 12. It says, the next day, the crowd, the great crowd, and so when we're talking about the next day, we're talking about the day after Jesus had eaten supper with Mary, Martha, Lazarus, and uh, Mary had used during the supper, had used some expensive perfume to anoint Jesus. And so immediately after this, the very next day, it says, the great crowd that had come for the feast, they heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and they went out to meet him shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it as it is written, Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first his disciples did not understand all of this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. It says in verse number 17 that the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead, they continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had given this miraculous sign, they went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Talking about having gone after Jesus. And whenever we're looking at these two passages and we're comparing them together, uh, we're looking and we're saying, okay, in each one we find something a little bit different. Now, that's the neat thing, and I want to encourage you, you know, we've been going through a chronological study of the Gospels, and so by now we, we have a pretty good understanding that what is written in one Gospel, we might find that written in another Gospel as well. But when we find it written in another Gospel, you might find some details written there that are different than what you read in the first account. And we shouldn't be surprised by that. If you and I went and we did the same thing, uh, since we're practicing social distancing the, these days, uh, let's just say that we happen to go into the same store around the same time. Well, we would obviously have to be six feet apart, and we would have to go through the store probably doing our own thing. And if when we came out of the store, we talked about what took place, we would have differing accounts of what took place there. It's not that either one of our accounts are wrong. It's just that they are different because we maybe noticed different things. Uh, we observed and we focused on a different aspect of what was taking place while we were there. And so we shouldn't be in any way discouraged. We need to see that whenever we're looking here at the Gospel of John, uh, it tells us about the size of the crowd. We don't really see that in the Gospel of Luke. We don't really see that the crowd is so large. We don't really see the background to why the crowd is so large. The, the crowd is so large we learn in John chapter number 12 because uh, whenever, whenever they were gathered there, they, they were there because Jesus had raised Lazarus. They knew about it. It intrigued them. They were like, there's something special about this guy. And so this crowd was large because of Lazarus. And you'll remember, Jesus had been eating at Lazarus' house. 
shouldn't be a surprise that those around were like, oh, hey, Jesus is back. There's something special there. Well, in the Gospel of Luke, we get the, two de the details that we don't get in the Gospel of John. In, in the Gospel of Luke, we find out that two disciples were sent ahead to find a donkey and a colt and to bring them back to Jesus. Interesting thing to think about here, and we'll kind of get into this a little bit in just a little while, but in order for the two disciples to go on ahead, you know what that meant about Jesus? Jesus had to pause and he had to wait. There was a reason why Jesus wanted to be able to go into Jerusalem riding on the colt of a donkey. He needed to be able to fulfill the Old Testament prophecy. He needed to be fulfilling every prophecy that was made about the Messiah. Also in Luke, we find that the disciples put their cloaks on top of the donkey and on top of the colt. We don't see that in the Gospel of John at all. However, in the Gospel of John, we see that the disciples, they didn't fully understand what was going on. Now, we find down there in verse number 16 that only after Jesus was glorified did the disciples realize that these things had been written about Jesus and that they, the disciples, had actually done all of these things to him. It wasn't as if Jesus had said to his disciples, hey, listen, um, you know, hey, listen, we, we got to try to make this all look legit. Uh, we've got to try to, like, make sure that everybody buys in. So here's what we have to do. No, they were going about their daily lives in Jesus. God had orchestrated it in such a way that Jesus was going to fulfill every one of the prophecies. The disciples, they weren't just like these little pawns that are like, okay, let me help uh, perpetuate a, a false story. No, they were doing these things. And then later on, they're like, oh, that's why we did that. Oh, that makes sense. I see. Now I see the Old Testament scripture. Now I see how it's fulfilled there. Wow. I didn't even know during, during the time that that's why we were doing that. You know, I think about it, the time that we're living in right now. It's hard for us to see and to understand that the, the time that we're living in, it's not just like some random happenstance. God knows what he's doing. He is sovereign. He is in control. And we will be able, I believe, whether in eternity or maybe even we get the privilege later in life to be able to look back and to say, ah, oh, that makes sense now. Maybe this is a time that you've had to pause and to really start reading God's word. You, you, your life has been so busy that you have just gone and gone and gone and ran and ran and ran and you haven't even had time for God to speak into your life and God is using this time to say, you know what, you have time. Why don't you spend some time with me? Maybe he's doing that with you and your family as well. Maybe you're having the opportunities to be able to sit down with them and later on in life, maybe you'll look back at, at this as the disciples looked back upon this event, the triumphal entry, after Jesus was glorified, after he was ascended into heaven, they look back and they say, ah, that makes sense. God is doing a work. Are you allowing him to work in you? So we see some different details in, in, in Luke and some different details in John. Also in John, we see the palm branches that we don't see in the Gospel of Luke. In the Gospel of Luke, we find that the crowd lays their cloaks on the road in front of Jesus. We saw the disciples doing it. We also see the crowd doing it. And we don't see that in the Gospel of John. But in both of them, we see the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. And I want us to take a look just a moment at the triumphal entry in a way that I'm not sure that I've ever done before. Uh, so let's look back to Luke chapter number 19 together. Now I'm going to turn in my Bible there, and you can turn in yours as well. Let's look back at Luke chapter number 19, and let's look at just a, a few verses together. So it says in Luke chapter number 19, in verse number 35, it says these words. They brought it, talking about the colt, to Jesus. So the disciples brought the colt to Jesus. They threw their cloaks on the colt, and they put Jesus on it. Verse 36 says this. It says, as he went along, talking about Jesus, the people, they spread their cloaks on the road. 
And, and as I was reading this, and I must have read each account in each of the Gospels, I don't know, four, five, six, seven times throughout the course of the week, just, Lord, what, what do you want proclaimed from this passage? Because there's so much truth and so much we can learn. And I kept going back to this. I kept going back to the cloak. And I've never in my studies looked back and just done a word search on a cloak or it's sometimes in the Old Testament called a mantle or you'll also see it used a, called a robe. It's an outer garment. And uh, so I wanted to go back and I wanted to do an, a word study on that. And so you can do this at, at home as well. Uh, you don't have to be a pastor to do a word study. Uh, you can go to a, a site, it's called blueletterbible.org, and you can punch in a passage, let's say. Now, the easiest way to do this is to maybe punch in a passage, read the passage, and then you're like, oh, okay, I kind of want to learn a little bit about that word. Well, there's a couple of different ways to do it. Either, number one, you can take that word, and you can punch that into the search box, and it'll search the entire Bible uh, for how many times that word is found and then you can look and you can say okay well here are the different times that that word is found you can also if you want to you can go to the KJV the King James Version and you can click there's a little thing called the Strong's Concordance and what it'll do is it'll give you all of the Greek numbers so the numbers that are, are, are equivalent to the concordance, it'll give you all those numbers. You can click on it, and it'll tell you how many times that actual Greek word, or if you're using the Old Testament, the Hebrew word, how many times that's found in the Old Testament, how many times it's found in the New Testament. So you can do these studies on your own. So I'll just be honest about the way that I did it. I went in, and I did a search uh, for the word robe. I did a search for the word cloak. And I did a search for the word mantle. And then I just looked at every time that they were found throughout Scripture. I looked and I, especially the Hebrew word, I tried to figure out, okay, well, which one is used in this particular instance? And which one is used in this instance? Is there a dramatic difference between them? And I don't want to lose you in all of this, but I just want to share with you a little bit about how you can go about doing a word study and why it is important and so whenever I go in and I read the Bible, what I like to do is I like to then put myself into the story. And so as I'm reading down through Luke chapter number 19 and I'm picturing this and I'm picturing the dusty roads because they wouldn't have had paved roads like we do. So I'm picturing the dusty roads and I'm picturing, you know, that, uh, that I've got my sandals on and chances are pretty good I have my tunic on and you're like, I don't know what a tunic is. Uh, well, a tunic would just be if you can picture like a long t-shirt that would go maybe to your knees or slightly below that would be the inner garment, uh, kind of like what we would call our underwear, so to speak. We call it underwear because we wear it under our clothing. And so the tunic would have been the lower layer of their clothing. And so I've got my sandals on, I've got my tunic on, and then we have our cloak or we have our outer garment on as well. And so uh, put yourself there, travel with me for a moment back into that time. We're actually a little bit on the hillside, and so we see that Jesus and, and 10 of his 12 disciples, they just stopped there along the road for a little while. And for some reason or another, two of the disciples, they go on ahead. And so we see this happen, and, and we by now know who Jesus is. We recognize him. We know that this group uh, of 12 disciples with Jesus, we, we kind of know what they're about. And so we're a little bit intrigued why a couple of them broke off and went somewhere else. Well, a little bit later, we find that these two disciples that were sent ahead of time, they come back with a donkey, and they come back with a colt. As they come back, they turn the donkey, they turn the colts, and they take off their outer garment and they put it on the colt, on the donkey. Okay, so they've taken off their outer garments. They've placed them on the back of the colt, on the back of the donkey. Jesus is now getting on the donkey and he is riding on the road that the two disciples went on just a moment ago. He's on his way to Jerusalem We've heard about his miracles. We, we heard about Lazarus having been raised from the dead. And so he's on his way to Jerusalem. And could this be 
Could it be the announcement that Jesus is going to be king? Travel with me as we move our way down that hillside and we come along the road and some of the people that are around us, they have started to take off their coats, their outer garments, the cloaks as you will, and they are not just taking them off to stay cool. They're not just stay, taking them off for no reason. No, they are taking them off and they are putting them on the ground. And you're starting to say to yourself, why are they taking off the outer garment? And why are they putting it on the ground? Is there some significance? Should I be doing the same? And since everyone else is taking off their cloaks and they're placing them on the road and you kind of have an understanding of history and you kind of have an understanding of why they're doing this, you say, you know what, I'm going to do that too. I want you to think of it this way because some of you right now, you might be having a hard time in your mind putting yourself back with a tunic, with a cloak over top, wearing sandals, walking down a dusty hillside. But picture for, for a moment, uh, you're in a conversation at a sporting event. Hard to picture right now, right? <laughs> Not too many of those taking place. But most of you have been to a sporting event. And uh, when you're at this sporting event, what always takes place at the beginning? You have to rise for the national anthem, don't you? And so you're in conversation and you don't realize that it's about that time. You haven't seen them lower the flag or you haven't seen someone come out to start singing the national anthem. You haven't seen any of that taking place. But what you start to notice is you start to notice everyone standing up around you. And whenever you notice everyone else doing it, you're like, oh, well, I better stand up too. And guys, at that point, you know, we take off our hats, we place our hands over our heart, and, uh, and we sing along or we listen along to the national anthem as it's played. Those back then, the crowd, they start one, takes off their cloak, their outer garment, and they lay it on the ground. The next... Yes, I should do that too. The next does it too. And pretty soon there's an entire roadway that is covered with the outer garments of this crowd. And the question has to be asked, what's the big deal about the cloaks? Why are they taking their cloaks off? And we need to remind ourselves of a few things. During the early part of Jesus' ministry, he often kept his identity as the Messiah a bit of a mystery the leper you remember what he told the leper when he healed him don't tell anyone who I am do you remember what he commanded the demons at times don't tell anyone who I am and and we're not going to get into the question of why Jesus did that but for the early part of his ministry he oftentimes kept that a little bit of a secret one of the reasons and again we're not going to go in depth on this you find out that the leper goes ahead and he just tells everyone this is what Jesus did. This is who he is. He's the Messiah. And you know what it says after that? Jesus couldn't go into the towns. He had to stay out in the countryside because his publicity was so well known. Well, earlier in the day, you know, as Jesus had sent two of his disciples to get the donkey and it's cold, he's, he, he's already decided, I'm going to make my identity, my identity as the Messiah, I'm going to make it public today's the day in the fullness of times as it's talked about in the scripture this was the time and so he had already made that determination we're not going to keep this quiet this is God's timing it's time to make known I'm the Messiah Messiah and so the disciples they come back they put their cloaks onto the donkey in its coat and then we see the people doing it and the question has to be asked why take their cloaks off and I want us to look back to the Old Testament because we need to understand this from a historical perspective. We need to understand this completely in alignment with history. And so let's look back to 2 Kings chapter number 9. 2 Kings chapter number 9. And I'll allow you just a moment to flip there as I do as well. And in 2 Kings chapter number 9, starting in verse number 12, well, let me back up just a moment. Let me back up and at least tell you what's taking place. So the prophet Elisha has, has come and he's already received word from the Lord uh, that Jehu is to be the next king. 
And so he is going to anoint Jehu as king. Now, when he goes there, uh, uh, Jehu is surrounded by his companions. And uh, he's surrounded by his companions, and, and Elisha says, I need to talk to you in another part. I need this to be a private conversation. They go in, they have this conversation. Elisha says, this is what the Lord says, you're going to be the next king. Well, he goes out after Elisha has talked to him, and his friends, of course, want to know, what did he want? A little bit of a crazy guy, Jehu said. No, 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 there was something to that. And you guys have all been in a situation that's similar, right? <laughs> You're sitting around, and all of a sudden, uh, someone comes in, and they say, hey, can I talk to you for a second? And they pull someone out of the room while everybody else in the room is like, oh, what's that about? wonder what they're talking about. Is it something we need to know? Is it something important? Uh, how, how are we... And so whenever he comes back, Jehu comes back, they start questioning him. And so then we pick up in verse number 12, and that's where we are right now. It says this, Jehu said, here is what he, talking about Elisha, here's what the prophet Elisha told me. This is what the Lord says, I anoint you as king over Israel. They hurried, check this out. They hurried, talking about his companions. They took their cloaks and they spread them under him on the bare steps. Then they blew the trumpet and shouted, Jehu is king. Leave that for a moment and, and just focus on that. What did they do? They took off their cloaks. They blow a trumpet and they say, Jehu is king. Well, that sounds similar to what we have read recently. Luke 19, verse 38. What did we read? Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. What happened with Jehu? He's the king. Put down our cloaks. And, and Luke, with, with Jesus, he's the king. You go to verse number 39. Some of the Pharisees, realizing what was taking place, they say to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Now, why did they say, Teacher, rebuke your disciples? Because they knew exactly what was happening. They knew that whenever uh, the disciples took their cloaks off and put them on the coat, they were saying, I acknowledge, we acknowledge Jesus as the Messiah. Whenever the crowd, when they started to take off their outer garments and they placed them on the ground, on the road in front of Jesus, you know what they're doing? They're saying, yes, Jesus is the Messiah. The disciples put their cloaks on the colt and the donkey for that reason. The people put it on the ground for that reason. It was a sign. Jesus is the Messiah. And I want you to know this. As far as historically, the cloak, the outer garment, is a symbol of authority. So for you to take yours off and to lay it under the feet or under uh, the backside to place it on the coat so that Jesus could sit there, to do that would be to say this, I release my authority and I put it under your authority. I release my authority, I put it under your authority. And we see this thing about the, the cloak or the outer garment, the robe, the mantle, we see this representative of authority throughout the scriptures. This might make a little bit more sense now to some of you. When you read in Genesis about Jacob making Joseph a special coat of many colors, his brothers weren't just jealous because, wow, he's got a nicer coat than us. No, when, jo when Jacob makes that coat, what he says is, Joseph, I acknowledge that you are going to have authority over us. We also see that whenever he follows that up with having dreams of the sheaves of grain bowing down, the sun, moon, and stars bowing down, the dreams line up with the coat. The coat, whenever Jacob makes it, and the brothers had to have known this. Oh, man, I remember Jacob and Esau. You remember how Jacob stole the birthright? He wasn't even the oldest, and he's the one that ended up with the birthright. For Joseph, who was not the oldest, not even near for Jacob to make him that robe. And then for the, the, the other brothers to realize, wow, he's going to be the one in authority. And then Joseph to say, hey, here's the dreams that I have. Maybe that starts to make a little bit more sense. 
It also, maybe whenever you start thinking about, wow, I feel like I remember in the Old Testament, whenever they would come to a point of repentance, what would they do? They would rip their coat. They would rip their outer garment and they would sit in sackcloth and ashes. Maybe it takes a little bit new meaning where we say, wow, they were acknowledging that the authority that I have felt that I've had in my own life isn't there anymore. If you look in 1 Kings chapter number 11, we're not going to do that together. You're going to find a prophet by the name of a. Ahu- Ahijah, A-H-I-J-H, Ahijah, he rips his robe. It says he's got a new one. It says he rips it into 12 pieces, and he ends up giving 10 of the 12. He gives 10 of the 12 representative of 10 tribes of Israel that were going to be torn away from Solomon. He gives the other, or he holds the other two. When David cuts off the corner of Saul's robe, in 1 Samuel chapter 24. And then he says, how dare I do such a thing? Maybe it makes more sense that when he cut off a corner of that robe, it was representative of some of Saul's authority because David had already been uh, anointed as the next king. And, but David says, I shouldn't raise a hand against God's anointed. Saul is the king. I shouldn't have even cut off a portion of that robe, which would have been representative of the authority that God had given to Saul. Isaiah chapter number three, verse six. uh, We find this, they're in a time of trouble. And it says that one says to the other, hey, you have a cloak. Why don't you be our leader? Why the thing about the cloak? Because it's representative of authority. And then get this. We've all read about, in Acts chapter number 7, Stephen, the first martyr, right? Whenever you read about that, what does it say towards the end of that passage, verse number 58? It says that those that stoned Stephen did what? They laid their coats at the feet of a man named Saul. They were acknowledging that Saul was their authority at that time. And so they put their coats there at his feet. So when the disciples, when they take off their coats, their cloaks, and they place them on the donkey, they're symbolically saying that they give up their authority in submission to the authority of Jesus. So now we come to the crowd, and it says, and we already read this in verse 36, as Jesus went along, the people now, the crowd, they spread their cloaks on the road. And you say, wow, such a large number of people acknowledging that Jesus is the Messiah. But we must pause for just a moment. We must pause because we know that in just a few days, this crowd is going to turn and they're going to yell, crucify him. And you say, well, if they took off their coats, if they took off their outer garments and they said they were acknowledging the authority of Jesus, then how could they turn around and do something different? And this has got to be the challenge of today. This has to be something you consider. The question is this, the crowd, I believe with all of my heart, they went and they did a symbolic gesture. They bowed to the authority of Jesus, so to speak, but that's all it was. It is a symbolic gesture. It wasn't real. And I would ask you at home, I want you to consider over the next few moments this question. Some of you may have been in a situation where you prayed a prayer with no sincerity in your heart. And you say, because I've prayed a prayer, although I didn't mean a word of it, then I'm a child of God. And I would challenge you with this. You may be among that crowd who took off their outer garments and in a symbolic gesture said, yes, he's the king. Hosanna to the king because everybody else was doing it. But I need you to consider this. Was it real? Now you want to talk about real. Let's look at this together. Matthew chapter number 16. Matthew chapter number 16. Turn in your Bibles there just real quick. And we're going to find Jesus asking a question. It says in verse number 13, Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi and he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist. Others they say Elijah and still others Jeremiah 
or one of the prophets. In verse number 15, I can see Jesus looking up and looking into the eyes of every one of the disciples and saying, but who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am, Peter? And Peter responds this way. Simon Peter, ever the bold one, he responds with every bit of sincerity in his heart. And he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. This is not a symbolic gesture on his part. When Peter takes off his outer garment and whenever he places it on the colt, and Jesus rides on the back of that colt on top of the garment of Peter. It's not a symbolic gesture. Peter is saying, my authority goes away. I submit myself to the authority of Jesus in my life. And I must ask you this question. Have you only symbolically bowed to the authority of Jesus? Or have you made him the Lord of your life? Have you said, listen, I am, I am acknowledging that as I had a conversation with someone this week, this week, I'm acknowledging that Lord me no longer exists. I submit my authority to the authority of Jesus. Have you ever done that? If not, you have missed the triumphal entry. Please don't be one of the crowd that simply has gone to church all of your life or part of your life uh, you've listened to me preach sermons. You've listened to others preach sermons. And you say, oh, that sounds nice. And, oh, Pastor Dave, you do a good job. And, oh, Pastor Dave, that was an encouraging message. No, don't miss it. Don't take off your coat. And I can just picture this taking place. Here's how I picture it. I picture that just as we rise for the national anthem, just as we place our hands over our hearts, just as we either sing along or we go along, listen along, whatever that might be, and then we sit down when it's over. I picture Jesus having come along. They take off their outer garment as a symbolic gesture, and then Jesus goes by. They pick it up. They put it back on, and away goes the rest of their life. And a few days later, they are amongst those in the crowd who are yelling, crucify him. And you say, I would never yell that at Jesus. No, but your life might be yelling it right now. If you are the Lord of your life, you are yelling, crucify him. If you are the one who is in charge of your time and your talents and your treasure, you're yelling, crucify him. You've picked up your coat. The title of today's message is don't pick up your coat. Leave it there on the ground at the feet of Jesus. Submit all of your authority to him. He is the one who is the Lord of your life, wants to be the Lord of your life. But if you have just symbolically gone along and you've taken off the outer, outer garment and you've put it back on to say, I'm still in control of my life, I want you to know you are no follower of Jesus. But here's the deal, you can be. You can be. Jesus came, and we, this week is what we call the Passion Week, the Holy Week. Jesus came to redeem you, to buy you back from the marketplace of sin, so to speak, to pay your sin debt. Your sin separates you from a holy God. It just does. And I'm going to encourage you and I'm going to challenge you to consider this. Will you continue to walk in your ways or will you allow the sacrifice of Jesus? Because this week we're going to celebrate that, right? We're going to celebrate that Jesus was willing to go to the cross as the eternal, final, permanent sacrifice for all mankind. And that the only way to Jesus is by placing your faith in his finished work. On Easter, we're going to celebrate that death didn't hold him down. We're going to celebrate that Jesus rose triumphantly over the grave so that there was no power. This almost all seems to make sense. If you've been listening to the other messages, this goes all the way back to Genesis 3.15. Whenever God says to the serpent, the seed of the woman will crush your head, that's going to happen this week. So the question becomes to you, will you bow to the authority 
of Jesus. Well, for a lot of that crowd, they weren't going to. And that's why we read these words continuing on in Luke chapter number 19. It says, as he approached Jerusalem, talking about Jesus, and he saw the city, it says he wept over it. And he said, if you, only you, if you'd have only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes if you'd have only known i don't want anybody to leave where you're seated this morning without knowing this the only way to peace the only way to security the only way to heaven is through jesus that's why he says i'm the way i'm the truth i'm the life no one comes to the father except through me everyone needs to hear this message if you've been drowning in despair if you've been hopeless Lost, not knowing what's going on in this circumstance, not knowing what's going on in, in this life, let me just assure you, submit your authority to the authority of Jesus. Trust in the finished work of Jesus for the payment, the only payment for your sins. Right now, I want you to consider praying these words. And I'm not going to close my eyes, and you don't have to close your eyes as well. But if you say, you know what, I've kept my coat on. Or maybe I've symbolically taken it off, but I've picked it right back up. I want you to pray these words. If you want, if you mean them, don't, don't. Do, we're not talking about being part of the crowd right now. I'm asking you, if you would want to submit to the authority of Jesus. In other words, say goodbye to Lord me and say hello to the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who is truly on the throne. The one who is truly the Lord. Will you allow him to be the Lord of your life? Will you put your complete confidence in him? If you want to do that, I want you to reach out to him this morning through prayer and say, Dear Jesus, my sin has separated me from you. My sin has separated me from you. But I don't want to be separated any longer. Jesus, I acknowledge you as the Messiah the one and only true God. And right now, Jesus, I turn from my sin and I turn to you. I trust in you only as the sacrifice for my sins. Be my savior. Be my rescuer. Be my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. We're talking about a real submission to the authority of Jesus. You know what it eventually does? It affects every area of your life. You know why these same disciples obviously had Judas who betrayed Jesus, right? But then you have the other 11. And do you know why history records that at least 10 out of the 11 were martyred for their faith? Because they genuinely submitted to the authority of Jesus in their life. I'm going to challenge you to live out your faith every moment every day because Jesus cares for you. He went into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. He's going to come back one day riding on a white horse with all the authority that he deserves and that he has. Will he be your Lord at that time? Every knee, every, every tongue will confess, every knee will bow one day. Bow it now on this side of eternity. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Oh, it's such a challenge to us, but such an encouragement as well for us to read about how you went in to Jerusalem and in the crowd, they had this choice in front of them. Will they really acknowledge you as Lord? Symbolically, they did it, but then they picked their coats right back up. Lord, may we be those who lay down our cloaks, lay down our coats, and we don't pick them up again because we submit to your authority. God, I pray for everyone through this time. Lord, if they're going through challenges in their family, challenges in their workplace, challenges just socially, emotionally, God, I pray that you guide them through this time. Help them to submit to you, the one who is omniscient, the one who is sovereign, the one who is in control, the one who is certain, the one who is on his throne. Help them to submit to your lordship this very day. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Be reminded of the most important thing about Palm Sunday, that Jesus is the one to whom we submit our authority. No more Lord me, Lord Jesus.
in him only. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. I'll see you soon.